I recently spoke to Richard Gill, the CEO of Navigate X. Now, he has worked with Tony Sieber for many years. In fact, he's the brains behind Tony Sieber's Rethink X. These guys make predictions which are almost always correct on where the world will go. They predicted accurately what would happen with solar, with batteries, with wind, with food. If they say it, there's about a 95% chance it's going to happen, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately because some of the things revealed in this video will shock you. They it shocked me, as you can, you'll see in the full video. If you want to see the full video, by the way, it's up on our YouTube member section. I'll put a link to the member section in the description below. Your report with Tony that I've read on, I read the full report from you guys. It says that robots will replace basically all of us. Yeah. So when you were saying before there's a storm coming, I think we're trying to pretend it's not because there's still that fear that we'll, we will be replaced and what will happen. I think there's a lot of fear out there about people being replaced because it's, it's been happening for, you know, a hundred years, but it seems like it's going to speed up in the, in the next 10 to 20 years. Do you believe that it's going to happen sooner or further away? It's going to happen very soon. I think it's going to happen way sooner than people think. Cool. Um, the, the, and it will happen for pure economic reasons. And all these technology disruptions happen for pure economic reasons. They're just cheaper and better than the alternative. Mm, yeah. So, um, you know, we're already seeing the disruption in in, in labor and in professional, you know, professional jobs. You know, if, if you want a quick agreement between two parties, up until a few years ago, you'd go and call your lawyer or you try and copy something from a, a previous sort of agreement you saw yourself and you'd, you'd hack away at it for a number of hours and get something that was full of holes but kind of achieved what you wanted. Or today you go on to ChatGPT or Gemini or Claude or something and you ask for it and in 10 seconds you've got something that's pretty darn good, you know, and you can tweak yeah. it in a few minutes, right? So that's already disrupting that entry point into those professional jobs. Finance and accounting. Um, mm. any of these kind of knowledge has been disrupted. Humanoid robots, and this is the reason we focused on humanoid robots rather than robotics in general, and I get asked this a lot. And the reason is that all our production tooling and systems are designed around a human form factor to operate. And whereas most of our robotics to date has been re-engineering processes around the robot. Yeah. Right? Here we're putting a robot who can come and they can use the same tools and they can do the same jobs as a human and they have this cost curve that's dropping really dramatically, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to retool any processes. They're kind of a walk-in replacement, if you like. And, and I think that's what's really profound. Uh, and so... It has profound implications for manual labor, for construction, production lines, all of all of those sorts of things, as well as um, gardening and you know, landscaping and cleaning and all, you know everything you can imagine. And, and I think the roll-on implications fall into other areas like education, you mm. know, um, and and the economics of it. I think are important you know it depending where you live in the world it, it, it currently costs about quarter of a million dollars and takes 20 years to add one human worker to the workforce yeah right and with yeah. humanoid robots it costs about thirty thousand dollars and takes a couple of months so people and, are very worried about about this disruption would you would you say that you see any fear out there yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think the fear is real and I think the fear is justified. And um, it's it's a – this is not like previous disruptions. I started my career in the early PC days where PCs were coming in and replacing the pools, the rooms full of 
mostly women behind typewriters typing stuff up and sending it into mailroom stuff. And then we sold PCs into them and then, then you know, and that, and that all changed, right? And that was the very start of my career. And whilst those secretary jobs disappeared or changed dramatically, there were new jobs created. You know, we, we didn't have web designers and, 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 you know, all these other IT sort of related jobs back then. So we created new jobs. I think the challenge with this disruption is it will create new jobs, but then it'll take those jobs too. Mm -hmm. So the fear is justified. And this is one of the really important reasons that with Tony and Jamie, we, you know, we, we got Stella out. They wrote this incredible piece of work that actually paints what things look like on the other side of the storm because that world is fundamentally different to what we live in today. And the concept for you and I and, and, and others to, for our survival to be based on us selling our time, we trade our time yeah. and attention for survival, and that's what we've done since the dawn of civilization 10,000 years ago. You know, the, and, um, you know, the fear comes from the fact, well, how will I survive if I, yep. if no one's buying my time? And that's why the disruption of all of these technologies all at once is great. If we make good choices as a species, as, as societies, if we make the right choices through this, we can transform our society to the point where we don't have to sell our time for survival. All of these technologies lead to a superabundance of energy, a superabundance yeah. of food and materials, a superabundance of transport, right? And with the right system, everybody can benefit. So we can solve some of these really intractable problems like poverty and inequality and things because we now have a technological capability to do that. And to so the book Stella, that's what's so powerful about it, is it is it explains this transformation that helps us set that North Star of where we need to aim. And the challenges for each of us is is um holding fast to that future and then trying to advocate for the right choices and decisions to be made along the way. Um, and one of them is ownership, right? So in our extractive world that we've all grown up in, uh, ownership rights have been a great way to capture wealth uh, mm. through through the system. And the more ownership rights you have, the more wealth you create. But in a stellar world, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And uh, one of the fundamental challenges or choices we as societies need to make as we go from today to stellar is really re-examining ownership and what that means. Um, if you think back 30 years ago to the birth of the internet and, you know, in those days, um, we had proprietary networks. We had, you know, the telephone companies. We had CompuServe and AOL and IBM NES and some of these big properties, Minitel in, in, in France and so forth. They were proprietary. And even Bill Gates in the in the early 90s, mid nineties came out with this book. It was talking about the information superhighway. It was all proprietary mm. controlled rent seeking networks. And the internet emerged and won over all of that for basically one key reason. It was open. It was open source. Nobody owned it. Right? Everybody could play. You had open source protocols and open source software stacks. And everybody could innovate and build on that. And that allowed us to go from scarce content, scarce connectivity, to superabundant connectivity and content and everything else, right? And that was a great transformation in, in the information sector. And that's uh, 
that's been really, really profound. But if we hadn't have had those open source softwares and open source licensing protections that came up, then um, we would not have the information world we have today. 